I'm very happy um, also to, to visit uh, the city a little bit. I'm a little bit jet lagged, so <laughs> bear with me. I hope everything will go fine. I, I will do my best. I arrived yesterday. So yeah, um, as, as you already mentioned, um, I will be talking about quantum simulation with atoms. And um, the idea would be that I first introduce the platform a little bit uh, for those of you who may not be so familiar um, with our systems and then um, explain to you how we can actually engineer different uh, techniques in order to simulate different types of hematite that we find interesting, starting from topological lattice models. And maybe if there's enough time, I give you a glimpse on what we were trying to develop for studying lattice gauge theories in order to go beyond condensed matter and look into high energy physics problems. So let's get started. Um, I thought it's still nice to have like a very short motivation slide on um, quantum simulation and why this is useful to begin with. So there are all of these different quantum technologies, hopes, applications out there, ranging from material science to building quantum computers, having applications in metrology, sensing, um, and then there's of course uh, the, the quantum communication research direction. And um, so there's all this uh, hope now, and I think what is new about this is that we are trying to make use of the interactions between particles and really harness entanglement in order to um, generate uh, interesting entangled states that can be useful for sensing, for instance, or also use um, entanglement in order to do more efficient computing when it comes to quantum algorithm, for instance. Now, as we all know, harnessing these interactions and engineering these systems is challenging to begin with. Uh, just because if we want to understand exactly what is going on, then we have this exponential scaling in the number of particles, which makes these systems very complex uh, to study. And um, this is the main motivation, in my opinion, for doing quantum simulation experiments. So what we are trying to do is understand better how uh, many particles interact with each other, what phases of matter we can engineer, and maybe even use them in order to find more efficient descriptions in order to approximate the dynamics, which is one application of quantum simulation as well. So not all of the um, regimes are necessarily um, suffering from the exponential complexity, right? So there can be simplified regimes, and those could be also identified in quantum simulation experiments. And uh, what the, the main task here really is, is to build um, a quantum system in the lab, uh, where we put individual quantum particles together and then engineer the microscopic interactions between those and um, engineer interesting systems of interest. Okay, so this is how it looks like uh, during the, the building of uh, one of our machines. So there's a picture that I've taken in 2018, um, where we started building our cesium quantum gas microscope, which is the one that I'm going to introduce first. Uh, so this is still uh, the first PhD student that started in my group with an empty lab. And um, so here you actually also see the various different stages uh, that are needed in order to uh, make a quantum gas microscope and produce the images um, for, for our uh, simulation experiment. What you see here is a vacuum apparatus. The, the part here on the right, so that's actually the oven. So this uh, section that is wrapped in aluminum foil um, is the part where we put, uh, in this case, five to 10 grams of cesium inside. So we really put um, this block of material inside the vacuum chamber. And then we heat it up, in this case, to about 90 degrees. And then we have these hot atoms that start to diffuse into our vacuum system that is built towards the left um, of this picture. OK, so we have these hot atoms that diffuse, and they go down uh, these uh, Siemens lower tube. And in our case, this vacuum chamber has an L-shaped configuration, and I'm going to explain to you in a second why that's the case. So now, at this point, um, it's purely classical. So we have these hot atoms, and there's not much quantum physics yet. Um, that is interesting uh, going on, we need to slow them down first. And the way this is done, and I'm sorry, I'm not very good with this laser pointer here, is that we uh, let them travel down this tube and we shine in a counter-propagating laser beam that is near tuned to an internal uh, atomic transition and then gradually slows down the atoms. And these magnetic fields are there in order to keep uh, the atoms in resonance as they decrease the velocity because we need to compensate for the Doppler shift. And then there's this first section of the vacuum chamber, which is the mod. And here we cool the atoms um, using laser cooling techniques. Again, the idea is um, we use near resonant light. Uh, we shine it in from all three directions in space. And the detuning is chosen such that whenever the atom and the photon are counter propagating, they can absorb a photon and get a pushback. And so we can gradually push back the atoms from all three directions and um, generate a friction force in order to cool them down. 
So here we reach about micro Kelvin temperatures. And again, I think something to keep in mind, which is quite remarkable, is that all this happens at room temperature. And just because we have um, this ultra high vacuum vacuum chamber, we can um, have these ultra low temperatures um, by laser cooling. So we hold the atoms in magnetic traps or optical traps. There is this extremely low temperature, but all the rest of the system is actually at room temperature. Okay, so that happens in this section of the vacuum chamber. Now, at the end, uh, we actually want to be able to manipulate individual atoms and see individual atoms. That means um, we need high resolution imaging systems, and we want to be able to get very close to our atoms using laser beams. This, um, this is actually a steel chamber. It's fairly big, so it's about this size. So it's very difficult to get close with optics un unless you put something inside the vacuum chamber. So in our case, what we decided to do is we transported the atoms into a different section of the vacuum apparatus. And this one is a glass cell that's fully made of glass. It has these uh, tiny little side windows. I will show it to you in a second. And this allows us to get very close with optics and build high numerical aperture imaging systems. OK, so this is an L-shaped configuration. So this is a 90 degree angle. Uh, so the question is, how do you actually get the atoms to move over to this other section in your vacuum system? And here we make use of the AC stack effect. So if you shine in a laser beam that is off resonant uh, to an internal transition, the atoms feel a potential energy landscape. So depending on the detuning, um, they either get sucked into the intensity maxima or they get expelled from the intensity maxima. That means you can actually build uh, periodic structures. And this is also what we use for the physics in the end. So you can use two counter propagating laser beams they interfere and uh, they generate a standing wave, which for the atoms will show up as this per periodic uh, potential energy landscape, where the distance here is given by um, the wavelengths divided by two. So now this is usually a tiny effect, uh, this AC stack shift. And if you plug in reasonable numbers for the intensity of the light, uh, the wavelengths, the tuning from a certain internal transition, you find that in terms of potential depth, you get to something like millikelvin for reasonable parameters. And we are actually already quite cold. So we reach micro Kelvin temperatures over here. So we can actually trap atoms in this, in this potential. OK, so what happens is we have this cold cloud of atoms over here in the chamber. Then we overlap the standing wave. And then in each one of these planes, there are like this pancake-shaped uh, configuration of atoms. We have a couple of thousand atoms per, per lattice side. OK, so that's great, because now we have the standing wave. But as you know, if you actually start to detune the frequency of one of these beams, this uh, standing wave will start to move, generate a running wave. And this will just drag the atoms along with it. So you first put them in, into these buckets, and then you move the buckets. That's the basic idea. So you can actually transport over this distance of 40 centimeters in about 30 milliseconds. And that's one of the main reasons why we implemented this technique. There are other techniques out there, but we wanted to do it fast. Uh, because one uh, key ingredient of these machines is also to be able to take a lot of images. We want to take a lot of statistics, so we don't want to waste unnecessary time during the preparation. Because at the end of the day, like this whole cooling cycle and then doing the quantum simulation experiment over here, taking a picture, that gives you one piece of information, one measurement, and then you have to repeat the whole thing all over again. And in this case, it actually takes about 12 seconds uh, per, per snapshot and that you need to wait. Okay, so now we are in the science cell. So there we have even better vacuum conditions, 10 to the minus 11 millibar. And we cool further to nano temperatures in order to form a quantum gas, um, either BC or a degenerate Fermi gas. And this is a picture of the glass cell that we are working with. So it has 11 side pods, a top and bottom window. And it's actually quite tiny. So just to give you an idea, so this window over here has a diameter of three centimeters. So it's extremely small. And the distance between the top and the bottom window is about a centimeter. So it's this tiny little thing. And in the end, we, we generate this crystal of light with atoms in the center of the cell, and we take uh, snapshots. And these side pods are then used um, in order to shine in lattice beams and generate a variety of different lattice potentials. And then the image will be um, taken by collecting photons from the top or, or from the bottom. And um, for all the rest of the talk, the only thing you need to know about degenerate quantum gases and BECs 
um, is so for most of the, the time I will talk about bosons. So the only thing you need to remember are BCs is that if you make them cold enough, they all accumulate in the ground state wave function of your trapping potential. So you can put like 10 million atoms in your lowest uh, harmonic oscillator wave function, and uh, that will be your BC. So in a nutshell, that's all you need to know uh, for, for what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. Okay, so we have this configuration. Simplest one would be a 1D lattice. And um, I told you that we form these cold gases at nano Kelvin temperatures. So we have these species, which you can prepare in the lattices. So after this last cooling step where we form the BC, after that, uh, most of the things we do are adiabatic. So we try to gently load the different uh, lattice potentials to generate different types of Hamiltonians and not heat them up again. That's the basic idea. So after this uh, first, this last cooling step, that's the lowest temperatures that we can achieve. After that, everything can just get worse again. We heat them up and there may be technical noise. So that will be the, the point of lowest temperature. And now if we have a um, more than one lattice, so for instance, we could overlap two um, retroreflected lattices along X and Y, you can form, for instance, the square lattice geometries. And if uh, we are cold enough and load the atoms into the lowest band of this lattice, then the dynamics is described by two parameters. There's J, which is a coherent tunnel coupling between neighboring sites, and U, uh, which is the Hubbard on-site interaction energy that's more than one atom per site. And that would be the Hamiltonian that describes the dynamics. A dagger A uh, describes hopping from one side to the other. So we destroy an atom on one side, J, and create it on site I. So that's a kinetic energy term. And then this one just counts how many atoms are per site that gives the interaction energy. And then uh, depending on the ratio of these two parameters, there's actually a transition from a metallic or superfluid state where the atoms spread out and are extended um, over the whole array that we have to an insulating phase where they try to avoid sitting on the same site uh, because the interaction energy is so large and that would be an insulator. And it's precisely that uh, transition that we use in order to generate specific initial states. So for instance, if you think about quantum computing applications, you would say, well, you want to have exactly one atom per site. And so you would uh, use this transition to the insulator where U is large and atoms avoid each other in order to have a situation where you have exactly one uh, site, uh, one atom per site and uh, no higher occupations and ideally no defects. And then we can take snapshots like this, uh, which I will explain in a second. And here you see by I, like which side is occupied with an atom or not. That's a square lattice. It's rotated with respect to this one. So you see that there are a couple of def defects, but you can count by I how many cesium atoms you have prepared in this lattice. And for taking these images, um, we make use of similar techniques that I explained on the previous slides. So essentially, after doing the quantum simulation experiment, you have your quantum many body wave function psi. And then in order to measure it, we want to freeze uh, the density. Okay, so we make these lattice potentials very deep so that the atoms cannot move around anymore. And uh, then we scatter near resonant photons. So at the same time, we uh, drive absorption and emission cycles and we cool. So we make use of similar ideas as the laser cooling I showed on the previous slide in order to scatter photons, which would heat up the atoms and they might be get, might get lost from the trap and cool at the same time so that they actually remain on the site uh, that they were initially in. And if, if this is done properly, we can collect a few thousand photons per atom. And so each, each one of these spots uh, that you have also seen on the previous slides is a collection of um, a few thousand photons that we did collect with this high NA objective and then imaged on a camera. So each cesium atom lights up and you can really take a picture of these cesium atoms that, that are sitting in the lattice. And uh, maybe something important to, uh, to remember or to realize here is that these images uh, that you see here um, are snapshots. So it's a projection of your quantum many body wave function onto occupation basis. So if you even if you prepare the exact same wave function or many body state in uh, repetition of your experiment, each snapshot will look slightly different. And then, um, so they, they would appear at random locations. For instance, if you have an, a mean filling of, um, I don't know, half in, in your lattice, each image would have random occupations of, of, your, of your distribution. And then if you evaluated the mean quantity, like the mean occupation on a specific site, you would find one half. But you need to take many snapshots 
And that's why it's important that the uh, cycle time is not, is not too long. And taking mean quantities is the easiest observable that you could look at. Um, you can do more complicated things. You can actually uh, evaluate correlations, density density correlation functions, and later, um, it's, it's actually not, not on this slide, but you could even measure like local coherences between neighboring sites um, in the lattice as well. Okay, so now um, this has been a technique developed in, in around 2005 for bosonic atoms. And since then the field really has exploded. So it started with bosonic atoms. In 2015, there have been a bunch of uh, fermionic quantum gas microscopes that have been reported. Uh, more recently, there have been also more complicated atoms like two valence electron atoms. And um, the question is, why did we decide to build yet another one with cesium atoms? And there are a few uh, properties specific to cesium that makes it interesting. But also I want to give you um, a short list of things that I think the, the field is still working on in order to um, continue the development of these quantum gas microscopes. So one thing is increasing the system sizes. So the, the earlier experiments had, had like a few particles, maybe 100, 200 um, atoms in, in the center. Now there are much larger microscopes as the one shown here with lithium. But what's also important is to not only have more atoms, but also to work on the quality and fidelity of these lattices. And um, the, the easiest way to, to see that is maybe to look at, at these uh, images that have been taken on a, on a potassium quantum gas microscope. In order to hold the atoms in place in this lattice, there's usually an, a harmonic trap that is overlapped on top of the lattice. So if you think about a simulation uh, where you're interested in the dynamics of a Hubbard Hamiltonian, you have this additional curvature on top. So there's actually a potential energy difference between neighboring sites that it increases towards the edge. And that's also why you have this round uh, shape of atoms that are trapped in the lattice. But for many of the questions that you are interested in, in answering, you, you don't want that. You actually want to have a clean homogeneous lattice and then uh, study the dynamics of that. And um, the second point uh, to highlight is the initial state preparation and detection, so fidelities of those. Um, the easiest to keep in mind would be, again, that you maybe may want to have like a register of atoms where exactly uh, one atom sits on each side without any defects. And uh, that requires to go to very low temperatures, um, because otherwise you will have empty sites and they, uh, they will mess up your, your quantum simulation. But um, right now, uh, what people can do is actually quite good. So we, it's possible to have 98% filling, maybe even 99.8% filling. I think that's the highest that has been reported. But then you easily run also in limitations uh, due to detection. Right? If you have this low fraction of defects, also your detection fidelity needs to be high enough so that you're not limited by that in the end. And then the other uh, thing that I want to highlight uh, is what types of Hamiltonian you can study. Because as you see in these experiments, we study the, the dynamics according to Hubbard models, so the coherent hopping and interaction on the lattice. So the, the class of problems that you can study or look at will be determined by what types of Hamiltonians you can engineer. This is analog quantum simulation. So we don't decompose this into trotter steps or gates or something in order to have a digital quantum computing device that could run any algorithm. Here, it's specific to the model Hamiltonians that you are able to generate. Okay, this is um, a picture from our cesium quantum gas microscope and where we are uh, at right now. Um, so there's a bunch of things that I would like to mention. So first of all, um, we have generated uh, this box potential. So essentially, the way this works is that all of these black regions where there are no atoms, they are blocked by repulsive walls. So we project a potential, like a bucket potential into the atomic plane where the, uh, the walls block where the atoms can go. So instead of having a harmonic trap, it's really just a, a sharp edge. That helps in order to reduce the harmonic confinement. But on top of that, we actually use a device that is called digital mirror, micro mirror device. Um, so there's a picture over here, which is probably not super helpful, but the, the micro mirror array, sorry, is, so this is just not correlated, right? <laughs> correlated, yes, but not, not very precise. Um, it's here in the center. So it's an, um, it's an array of like a million tiny little mirrors that you can switch uh, on and off. So if you shine in a laser beam onto this um, little device, you can um, change the intensity profile. So for instance, you can block out 
the square region and then project that pattern into the atomic plane. Now, why am I saying this is because we use it for two reasons, first to make this um, confinement. And the second reason is to flatten the bottom of the trap. So there, there will always be some residual harmonic confinement. So if we load atoms in a superfluid or metallic regime where they can actually move around into this potential, and there's a local minimum somewhere, they will be dragged towards the uh, local minimum. And uh, by just measuring the density profile, we can compute a compensation mask. So we pattern the intensity profile of the laser beam, and then we compensate uh, this residual harmonic confinement. And after a few iterations, you see that uh, the superfluid or the meta metal and spreads uniformly um, at the bottom of this box trap. So by doing this, we actually managed to create large systems of about 50 by 50 sites. Um, we have pushed this a little bit more in the meantime. So now we can have a few thousand atoms in this lattice and it's nicely flat at the bottom. So we don't suffer from any potential energy offsets. And for the moment, we have fillings on the order of 98%. And um, it's actually quite difficult to see um, where the atoms sit. So previously I showed you a different image, which was cheating kind of, because uh, you could only see the atoms by eye because we left every other side empty. So then you can actually see it by eye. The lattice here um, has a separation of only 380 nanometers between neighboring sites, which is um, really challenging to resolve optically. We had to develop new techniques in order to make that work, uh, which was based on unsupervised machine learning. I think the reference was on a previous slide. If you're interested in how that works, I'm also happy to share the reference. But we used machine learning techniques. They're quite popular now, and we also use them. But it actually helped quite a lot um, to reconstruct the density. OK, so let me show you um, one experimental result uh, that just illustrates um, how useful it is to have these large systems. And one uh, type of experiment um, that we do is quench experiments. And this relates to a fundamental question. If you prepare an isolated quantum anybody system in your trap and you let time evolve according to a certain Hamiltonian, you may ask what happens to it? Uh, like, does it thermalize? So we know there's unitary time dynamics, but is there a notion of thermalization? And what does that even mean? Are there systems that may not thermalize? And um, we have looked at that in ladder systems. Um, they seem quite simple because they, there's only a hopping parameter and interactions. But in fact, it's actually super challenging to compute these uh, time evolution dynamics exactly. And what we prepare is this wrong charge density wave. So these red balls indicate where the atoms sit originally. And then we just let time evolve. Now, what happens is that atoms start to hop around. And um, there's actually no reason for you to expect that after a long evolution time, any of this initial charge density wave would be would be left or that, that you would detect anything of it. You would expect that the, the profile would just become homogeneous, right? Atoms spread out, and then you would measure a homogeneous filling of, of one half. And that is indeed the case. However, what also happens is that as a function of this parameter, JPERP, you have different relaxation dynamics, which change from ballistic spreading to diffusive dynamics. And in fact, if you actually look only at the mean uh, filling in this ladder, you will not be able to detect the difference between the two. In both cases, the system thermalizes, the charge density wave disappears, and you just find a homogeneous density. But you can actually see the difference by looking at correlations. And this is really based on the idea of evaluating the snapshots independently. You can look at fluctuations, and you can look at density-density uh, correlation functions. And this is what you see here. So that's the um, correlation function measured as a function of time, which reveals this nice ballistic cone. And as we tune the coupling between the chains, you see that it goes from ballistic to diffusive. And this is really given in the statistics of the snapshots that we can take. And what is nice here is that we have this coherent evolution over large distances of, of like 20 sites, um, which is only possible because we have this nice homogeneous box. Uh, this can actually be used also to measure diffusion constants, which is um, a hard problem to calculate. And there's actually a lot more interesting physics in there. Um, if you're interested, uh, we have put this uh, paper on the archive. I will not go into the details uh, right now. Um, ah, yes. OK, so I did include a few slides on the unsupervised machine learning um, because I think it's interesting. And maybe there are a couple of remarks that I can make or highlight, um, which uh, work even more interesting in my opinion. 
So here, um, actually, you, you can see uh, the images or one example of images that we deal with in the lab. So that's raw data that comes out of our experiment. And what we can do is we can reconstruct the positions of uh, the, the minima in the lattice potential. This is something that we know where they are. We know the lattice constant, and we also know the absolute position. But if you look at the fluorescence images, you see snapshots like this. And um, you could play the game trying to figure out what the occupation is. So each atom gives you the same response, the same brightness. And in principle, you just add up point spread functions, right? It's a linear problem. It's quite simple. But if you look at these uh, white spots, which mark the lattice sites and the, the, the signal that you detect on a camera, you immediately realize that you have basically no way to tell where the atom is sitting. So the brightness is actually highest in the center, right in between the lattice sites, because you have overlapping spread functions, and um, it's basically impossible to know where the atom is sitting. However, you could also say, well, this is quite a deterministic problem, because you know the response from each individual atom. So you, it's just a deconvol deconvolution for you. And then the question is about signal to noise, like how much experimental noise do you have on top of that, um, which decreases the fidelity of that. Turns out that for our parameters, all of these algorithms failed. You can also say maybe we didn't do a good job in implementing. Uh, we cross-checked with many other colleagues, so we let a lot of people try. And if you manage to do it, I'm happy <laughs> to learn about that. But as far as, as, far as I can tell, um, the deconvolution algorithms that, that we know of failed in order to do the reconstruction. And so um, we came up with this autoencoder architecture. And uh, the idea is the following. You feed in these experimental snapshots on the left, and then these uh, different layers of the neural network, they do a deconvolution, um, deconvolution on your original image. So it has kernels, it, it um, optimizes the parameters in order to reduce the input information to the, to the minimum essential information that is necessary in order for you to reconstruct the image. And um, essentially the minimum information that you need is an array of zeros and ones, right? So you want the network to give you an array of zeros and ones, and then you can calculate the convolution with the point spread function, and then this should give you the original image back. And that's exactly what it did. Uh, so we have this bottleneck, so we constrain it to, so we force it to give us this uh, 16 by 16 array, zeros and ones. And then how the optimization works is that it does the uh, convolution again, and then minimizes the difference between the two. And using that, we were actually able to get very large um, fidelities and this is also a very robust implementation. Also tried supervised learning just using simulated images, but this is very sensitive to uh, any drifts in the experiment. So if your parameters very slightly, then the algorithm will fail. However, um, feeding in this initial snapshot it does a lot in order to improve uh, the performance. And um, so this is the reference down here. In order for it to work nicely, uh, we had to uh, train it on different densities. And that's an additional uh, subtlety. Uh, there's actually a density-dependent brightness in our experiment because there are collective uh, scattering phenomena. Since the distance between neighboring atoms is smaller than the wavelengths of the light used for imaging, there are collective effects that, um, that arise, which the network actually managed uh, to learn as well. Uh, so this was another important uh, task for us in order to get this to work. And then the reconstructed images look like that. You feed in a snapshot like this from your experiment, and then what it outputs is an array of zeros and ones. And then for the data analysis, we just work with these arrays of zeros and ones um, for the analysis. Okay, and that's how the experiment looks like now. <laughs> so um, on the previous image, you saw the Siemens lower and like where we do the transport to the glass cell. Um, this is actually only a small section of it. The whole uh, Siemens lower apparatus and everything is in the back. All this is just stuff that is built around this tiny glass cell that has this three centimeter diameter. And all these optics is needed in order to produce the BEC and produce all the various different lattices uh, that we have implemented in our experiment. You cannot really see it because the glass cell is hidden behind one of these yellow pillars over here. And in addition, we have like a magnetic field uh, system ar built around it. And um, I have to say this experiment is really quite crazy in terms of optics. And I'm very proud that the students still manage to handle it and actually implement even more beams uh, whenever I, I come up with some crazy, crazy proposal. Question of what uh, Hamiltonians <clears throat> we can actually simulate. 
And um, I already started uh, to give you one example about quench dynamics, but just to emphasize that again, there are really two different classes of experiments that one can do. Um, the first one by studying ground state physics. So you just try to adiabatically change the parameters of your system. And um, this is one example I've taken from Markus Granner's lab where they studied the Fermi Hubbard model at half uh, where you see antiferromagnetic correlations between the spin up and spin down atoms, which are shown as red and blue. And then as a function of the parameters of the Hamiltonian, you can ask questions about the properties of the different ground states uh, that you can have and study the phase diagram. The other class of experiments is really quench dynamics. This is one other example of uh, studying localization two dimensions from Emanuel Bloch's group. Um, but I already gave you one example in these ladder systems where you can, for instance, uh, um, ask fundamental questions about the thermalization of isolated um, quantum many body systems. And just to emphasize again, so these Hamiltonians um, are engineered in the lab directly. And we look at time evolution and ground state physics, but we have the Hamiltonian. So it's not a digital computation. We don't apply gates. And so it really boils down to the question, like in terms of applicability of our quantum simulation experiments, what Hamiltonians can you actually engineer? And how about the uh, Hamiltonians are interesting? I mean, you know, there's still plenty of open questions when it comes to the Hubbard model, um, but you may, may want to study systems that you don't have naturally access to um, in, in your lab. And we were inspired by the idea of studying fractional quantum hall insulators in our system. And uh, this is basically the plot that you see over here. So there are these plateaus in the transverse Hall conductivity or Hall conductance that one can measure. And many of them at the integer values, um, they are very well understood. You can understand them from a single particle description, just looking at the band structure. But all these fractional values uh, give rise to many open questions. And they emerge truly due to interactions between the particles. So that's a many body system. And uh, so that's one of the uh, regimes that is particularly interesting for quantum simulation because we can hope to generate um, similar states and then look at their unusual properties like uh, fractional um, strange statistics, anionic excitations, um, and fractional quasi particles. Okay, um, very briefly, uh, for those of you who don't remember uh, what quantum Hall effect is about, we have a two-dimensional electron gas. We send a current through and we can measure voltages. And there's a perpendicular magnetic field. So if you have charged particles in a perpendicular magnetic field, they experience a Lorentz force, and then you have the whole voltage that builds up. Now, in the, in the classical regime, there's a linear relation between the transverse hole resistance and the applied magnetic field. And really what we are interested in is the quantum regime, where if the temperature is low enough, the sample is uh, pure enough, and the magnetic field is high enough, you see these plateaus. And these plateaus, um, and the origin of these plateaus is due to the topology of the energy bands that are occupied with electrons. And um, the topological robustness comes in um, for, the, for the precise value of these plateaus, um, which are just given by natural constants, the Planck's constant and um, the charge of the electron. And otherwise, the only thing uh, that is, or the only ingredient that is missing is this integer number, uh, which is the churn number or the topological invariant that characterizes um, the state of the system. And in summary, that's what is written here. So the transverse Hall resistance is given by h over e squared. And then uh, the only other interesting quantity is i, an integer that is given by the sum over of the topological invariants of the bands that are occupied with the electrons. Now, all of this is single particle. The interesting physics that we are interested in is the fractional values that happen in between. Okay, so I'm just giving you the simple picture here because that's also the starting point for us to actually work on this. And I can already uh, tell you on this slide what's the problem. If we want to generate any of these systems, we need to find a way to generate the Hamiltonian. If you start from this electronic version, the new problem really is that our particles are charge neutral. So if I apply a magnetic field, there's no Lorentz force. So any of these physics um, will not just naturally emerge in your system if you prepare atoms in, in your lattice. And um, like neglecting the interactions for now, that's your Hamiltonian. So we have the hopping matrix element between neighboring sites, which also gives the kinetic energy. And uh, the idea of our quantum simulation experiments, and that also extends to, towards the ideas of studying then high energy physics problems, is really to try and find a model Hamiltonian H that um, resembles the physics that you're interested in, um, but is also as simple as possible for you to engineer. And uh, this is something I've not mentioned in the beginning. 
So we, we get rid of all the complexities, right? There are no defects, there are no phonons, there, there's really, we, we boil down the condensed matter physics problem to the to the bare minimum, just the essence, which in a Hubbard model limit uh, boils down to two parameters, J and U. And here it's even simpler, we just have J. Okay. <laughs> and now I'm trying to make this Hamiltonian that only has couplings a bit more interesting. Okay, so let's just assume we have the square lattice, there are electrons, and we apply a magnetic field, and we want to see how the Hamiltonian is different. And um, uh, what you find is that these hopping matrix elements, they become complex, there's a phase. And the most intuitive way to understand where this phase comes from is to remind yourself about the Aharonov-Bohm effect. And um, to remind you, Aharonov-Bohm effect essentially is that if you build an interferometer, you have an electron wave packet, you split it, you make it travel around two paths, and this interferometer encloses an area of non-zero magnetic flux. Then at the end of your interferometer, there's a relative phase that is picked up by the, by the wave packet, which is given by the closed integral over the vector potential A that is generating the magnetic field. Okay, so that means there's a phase associated with this interferometer, which is directly related to the, to the flux that is piercing the area, which would be S uh, times B in this case. Okay, so now you can just translate that to the lattice, it's a discretized version of that. Um, so if you have phases along all of these bonds, and the Haran of Bohm phase, if you build an interferometer around this plaquette, would then be directly related to a magnetic flux piercing the unit cell. And that's actually all there is. So you have complex hopping matrix elements in your Hamiltonian that give rise uh, to phases. If you think about a Haran of Bohm type experiments, and uh, if you have these phases, well, then that's just equivalent to having a magnetic field, a magnetic flux piercing the unit cell. And that's just perfect because now um, you just find need to find a technique for your lattice system where you can make these hopping matrix elements complex, and then it's just the exact same Hamiltonian. And that's the basic idea of quantum simulation. Find this minimal Hamiltonian you're interested in that gives rise to the physics that you would like to study. And then you will find techniques in your lab that allow you to do that. And um, yeah, maybe just a comment. Then of course you can uh, decouple yourself from the original problem, the electronic solid state system. Now you just engineer phases. So you're really not limited at all in terms of actual physical parameters. So if you think about an, a solid state material that has angstrom uh, distances between neighboring sites, and you want to engineer phases on the order of two pi, which would be very large uh, magnetic fluxes, you, mean, you would need a couple of thousand Teslas. That's um, quite challenging to do. Um, but here we don't care. We engineer the phases, we imprint them using laser beams. So you, you can really engineer anything you like. And the way we do this is by periodic driving, also known as Floquet engineering. So we take our Hamiltonian parameters, we modulate them periodically in time. And if we do that as a, at a large driving frequency, we can engineer new types of Hamiltonian. And this is based on Floquet's theorem. So what you see here is the time evolution operator, one period of the drive, capital T. And because it's periodic, what Floquet's theorem tells you is that after integer multiples of this modulation period, the system effectively evolves according to this Floquet Hamiltonian HF, which is time independent. And um, the most intuitive picture for thinking about this Hamiltonian HF would be in the fast driving regime to think about the time average. So a classical example would be if you start um, with, a, with a particle in a, in a saddle potential, and you, you can actually not trap it, right, because it's a saddle. Um, but if you start rotating it at the correct frequency, um, the effective trap is, is in 2D, and you can actually trap a particle there. That's like the simplest picture of, of this Floquet Hamiltonian HF, which would be the time average um, of your periodically driven Hamiltonian. And um, so I I'm, don't think I will have time uh, to explain this, um, but um, this comes at, at um, the cost, or actually it's, it's also a feature if you want, um, that you have quasi energies. Uh, so the energy uh, is only defined up to integer multiples of the driving energy quantum h bar omega. So in this two band model, if you diagonalize HF, you would find these two bands, but they are actually multiple repetitions and they are all separated by h bar omega. 
And this has uh, two consequences that are maybe interesting to mention. First of all, you can generate topological states um, that have no static analog because you can have gap closing points between Floquet zones that give rise to very interesting topological features. The second thing that is a bit less nice is that if you now put um, interacting particles, for instance, in the bottom of this band, there are additional scattering resonances that lead to heating just because you have many of these bands. So while originally, um, if you had a cosine dispersion and you put um, atoms at the bottom of the trap, those would always be stable. Now you can have scattering that looks like heating because you can transfer energy between different Floquet blooms. But um, it, at the end of the day, um, it gives you a new tool um, that allows you to engineer Hamiltonians um, that, that you don't just get naturally when loading atoms. And that's just a cute little experiment um, that's, that's already pretty old. Um, but the first thing that you may look for in order to see if you are actually engineered something like a Lorentz force would be a cyclotron orbit. So this is uh, something we know for electrons in magnetic fields. And this is an experiment that has been done on a tiny plaquette on four sides. You put one atom in there and uh, look at the dynamics and see if it um, forms a, a chiral orbit. We tracked uh, this position and we indeed see that there's there's a chiral motion. It's not it's not a nice beautiful circle. This has uh, different uh, reasons. So for instance, it's it's highly discretized, right? It has only four sides. And uh, the other reason is that this was an, an old experiment. So it's not a quantum gas microscope. It's averaged over many different plaquettes. And so this leads to an effective dephasing and damping. But this is actually quite close to what you expect uh, from theory as well. Now, to show you a few nicer cyclotron orbits, this is an experiment from 2020, uh, which has been done in, in Silvana Sundbens group at Collège de France, uh, with just prosium. And here you see very nice, beautiful um, cyclotron orbits that have been done in a, in a similar technique. Um, which is called synthetic dimensions. Okay, so using this periodic driving, uh, really two important kinds of matter model Hamiltonians have been realized. The first one is the Hofstadter model, which is a square lattice, um, which has a, a homogeneous magnetic field. And the second one <clears throat> is the Haldane model. It's defined on a hexagonal lattice. So here there are the AB sublattices shown in black and white. <clears throat> and what's different compared to the high end, uh, compared to the Hofstadter model, is that in this case, there's no homogeneous background field. So if you look at the nearest neighbor hopping, uh, these tunnel coupling terms, they are all real. There's no phase, but the phase is on the next nearest neighbor hoppings. So if you actually um, follow or compute an Aharonov ohm phase around this hexagon, you find it's zero. But nonetheless, it breaks time reversal symmetry and gives rise to topologic topological bands. And both of these models have been realized in cold atom experiments. So, so let me let me maybe explain you two two main experiments I think I can manage <laughs> that we have done um, in this regard, um, which should convince you that um, we are actually able to simulate these topological systems. And um, here's um, the definition of what topology means. So if you look at the energy bands in your system, the topology is characterized by how the eigenstates change as a function of your Hamiltonian parameter or your parameter space, which in our case, is labeled by Qx and Qy. So you have a periodic lattice potential. If you diagonalize the system in order to get the eigen energies and eigenstates, you live in quasi-momentum space. So it's spanned by Qx and Qy. And here you are the cell periodic block functions. There's this quantity called the Berry curvature, which really tells you how these eigenstates wind as a function of Qx and Qy. And uh, this gives rise to non-trivial uh, behavior, for instance, uh, like local Hall deflections, which we'll in a second. And if you integrate this quantity, the Berry curvature, over your uh, complete manifold, which in our case is the Berlin zone, and divided by 2 pi, then this is quantized to an integer value. And this is the churn number, which gives you the topology of the band. And this is the, the quantity that is relevant for the integer quantum Hall effect. Now you should think about your system as uh, decomposed into bands. Each band is labeled by an integer quantity. And if you sum up all of these up to the Fermi energy, then this is the prefactor in front of your, your Hall inductance. 
And the robustness, the easiest way to see how the robustness comes in is um, by recognizing that this global curvature, which gives you the geometric property of the band, if you integrate it over the whole band, it's contest to an integer. So you cannot uh, smoothly deform it, right? If you just uh, change your band a little bit, it still needs to be an integer. And the only way it can change is by having a, a gap closing point. Two bands need to touch, and then the topology can change. And it's again quantized to an integer. But if you just smoothly deform it, nothing's going to change. And this is, in essence, what gives you the robustness um, of the quantum Hall effect. And what's nice is that in cold atom experiments, we can actually locally map out the sparrow curvature. So this is one example from uh, Christoph Weitenberg's group in Hamburg, where the sparrow curvature was measured locally as a function of Qx and Qy in the hexagonal lattice. OK, so one of the first things that you might want to do after seeing cyclotron orbits is to actually reproduce the integer quantum Hall effect and just measure Hall deflection. And the question is, how do we really do that? Because if you look back at your solid state example, where you send a current through and then you measure voltages, that seems quite hard. But there is actually a lattice analog for cold atoms uh, to do that. And uh, this is done by first applying a force. So you have your cold cloud in the lattice, then you tilt it, and the atoms experience a force. But what actually happens that is in the direction of the force, the atoms undergo block oscillations. There's no net transport in the direction of the force. Uh, the atoms will, will remain stuck in the lattice. There's dynamics, but they will not move in the direction of the force. And this give, is given by the dispersion relation. <clears throat> but there's actually another contribution to that which um, is determined by the very curvature, this non-trivial geometric property of the band. And this contribution to the velocity is transverse to the force. And this is the um, whole deflection analog that you know from, from electrons. So we expect that if we just take snapshots of the cloud, the atoms will start to move sideways to the direction of the force that we apply. And if now all the quasi-momentum states are occupied and you compute the center of mass motion, so the integral over the barrier curvature, so you get a center of mass motion that is proportional to the churn number of the band. And if you then look at the transverse deflection of the cloud, you find um, motion that is proportional to the churn number. And this is essentially the integer quantum Hall effect for charged neutral atoms, cold atoms, in an optical lattice. So you find this linear deflection, and from the slope, you can directly fit the value of the churn number. And maybe something interesting to, to note here is why this is in principle equivalent uh, to the integer quantum Hall effect. This experiment has been done with bosons, um, no charge, and um, it was even like a, a thermal distribution in this, in this lowest band. So it's a completely different system. It has nothing to do with the solid state experiment that you know of. Nonetheless, the, the physics behind it is, is exactly the same. Okay. Now, I actually um, will not go through this, <laughs> so we can actually make use of periodic driving to realize anomalous Floquet systems that don't have any static analog. But um, I want to show you one result um, before I close, um, which is about uh, studying what happens at the boundary, at the edge of the system. As you know, in the integer quantum Hall effect, um, transport happens um, via topological, topologically protected chiral edge modes at the boundary of the system. So this would be something um, extremely nice to see in, in quadratum experiments, but it's also extremely hard because in most of the experiments for now, we had this harmonic, smooth harmonic confinement, and there's really no sharp edge. And um, let me just go that slide. Sorry, now you have to bear with me for a second. So this is done in, in hexagonal letter, but it doesn't really matter. It's about it's here. And so the question is how to generate edge mass. Okay. And um, the way we do it is as follows. We have our hexagonal lattice, and it has topological bands. Now we need a sharp edge. So similar to before, we use our digital micromirror device, and we project a wall that generates the boundary. And then we produce a Bose-Einstein condensate localized in real space and move it to the edge of this potential. What you see here in this uh, schematic is a repulsive disk that blocks a region in the lattice where the atoms cannot go to. So that's our boundary. Use the tweezer to prepare a localized wave packet over here. And then you let it evolve as a function of time and see what happens. 
And um, for our resolution, um, the smoothness of the wall is about two to three uh, lattice sides. Okay, so now this um, defines the edge. The dashed line shows the repulsive wall. And the blue spot is the initially localized weight packet. And now we let it evolve as a function of time. And what you see is that the, the wave packet spreads out, but it actually only spreads out along the line of the system. And if you change the chirality of the modulation, it goes in the opposite direction. If you actually look at the difference image between the two, you nicely see that the atoms only move along the edge and propagate in opposite directions. And this is the result that I like most. We have this negative bucket, if you want. So we have the atoms prepared at the outside of the bucket. And they nicely wrap around um, this bucket, which shows the chiral uh, motion of the atoms. And again, to change the modulation direction and take the difference image, we nicely see the symmetry uh, between the two. And um, what we have done also in this club, you, you can now ask a lot of interesting questions because you can get full control over the shape of the boundary. Right? You can make it more smooth and um, cut along different angles and ask um, how like what's the minimal height of the step that you need in order to have a topological interface to begin with? And, and all of this is something that we can play around um, in our collaborative environment. So that's the team. So of course, I'm not uh, not doing this alone. So that's the cesium quantum gas micros microscope team and the hexagonal lattice team. And we have two uh, new experiments that we use the properties of ytterbium atoms. So the two valence electron atoms uh, to first of all, make use of the optical clock transition also to have more flexibility in terms of local state dependent potentials and we make use of uh, tweezer arrays to have local manipulation um, of the motion of the atoms and the state of the atoms. Thank you very much.